tap into the psychology of engagement and more. This is where we talk about life, learning, and everything in between. This is the Lifelong Podcast, a show for those of you who love to ask why. Because we're marketers, it's because we're coaches, it's because we're change makers. Each week, we dive into the big questions and explore the psychology of engagement with strategies, tactics, and special guests along the way. Now, here's your guide, the visibility hacking queen herself, Coach Molly. Hey, visibility hackers, and welcome back to the Lifelong Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Molly from visibilityhacking.com, and as per usual, it's an absolute pleasure to have you guys here today. You could be anywhere. You could be sitting on a beach with the best sunset in the world, but instead you are wherever you are listening to me. And I think that's really awesome. And I am so grateful that you're here, guys. Okay, today it's uh, it's Thursday, which means it's time for another conversation. And oh, well, okay. You know, I love each and every one of my guests. Clearly, I wouldn't bring them on if I didn't have some kind of a heart soul connection to them, or I thought they were absolutely brilliant. And today we have a mix of both. I'm on this like total tangent in the last couple months to talk to as many doctors as possible. And well, I've lined up yet another one for you guys today. So backstory. I chatted to this amazing doctor a few months ago for her podcast and well, in the spirit of collaboration and badass women helping badass women, um, we created a a stepping stone to something pretty awesome that I'm not going to tell you until I tell you more details some other time. So that's my cliffhanger for today, guys. That's my seed of wisdom. So who are you, my guest, and what do you do? Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. It's a real pleasure. Who I am. I am a badass entrepreneur, author, psychologist, public health professional, and all around ass kicker. Oh, so, so you do a few things apparently. I do a few things. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And a veteran. (laughs) And a veteran. And a veteran. Yeah. (laughs) So I was uh, an army journalist. I went to school to be a clinical psychologist, did that, uh, moved on to being a health services researcher uh, and professor and uh, center director in academia. And now I run my own consulting firm. I write books. I launched an institute recently to help people in healthcare, academia, and nonprofits become the leaders they want to be. And uh, on the side, I do home remodeling and running. Yeah. You are so cool. And I'm bi-coastal. You are so (laughs) cool. Oh, my goodness. Dr. Jennifer Wisdom in the house. Thank you. (laughs) First first and foremost, uh, coming from a family of journalists, I have to ask, how, how did you become a journalist in the military? What was that like? And what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, absolutely. So I, my family didn't have money for college. I thought I wanted to be a journalist. So I found out the U.S. Army, you can enlist as a journalist. So 18 years old, I went to basic training and then Iraq invaded Kuwait when I was in basic training. And my uh, idea of just kind of gallivanting around Europe and going to school at night was a little bit changed. Not too much, though. Uh, I was able to keep to go to school anyway in and around deployments to uh, Southwest Asia is what we needed to call it. You know it as Saudi Arabia uh, during that time and uh, got to travel all over, which was amazing. Uh, You know, wearing camouflage, driving army trucks, taking photographs, producing a newspaper. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. And then uh, after a couple of years in Germany, got some more training for intermediate intermediate photojournalism and editing, which I love both of, and then went to the Mojave Desert. I think that was payback for Germany. Uh, I was there a couple of years too, uh, and and then ended up getting out so I could go to graduate school. But what I learned, let's see, I always say the army made me a feminist. I grew up in a pretty conservative family, but uh, wow, it's just like patriarchy on speed and a bunch of young men with guns <laughs> and a bunch of people who are coming from lots of different walks of life, uh, but all of whom 
felt this was the best choice for them for different reasons, of course, but this was, you know, what they wanted to do all career, all volunteer army. And, you know, it's a, it's an interesting microcosm of society. Definitely let, met a lot of people from different areas. So from different parts of the country that I wasn't as familiar with given where I grew up. So I got to meet lots of different kinds of people and see lots of different ways to do things. And one of the best things I got out of it was a ton of leadership training and the army is, is rough in a lot of ways, but it does some things really well. And leadership training is one of them. <laughs> so I, uh, I took every leadership course I could. Uh, of course, a lot of the leadership involved like leading a squad to attack the enemy or whatever, you know, but hey, that is a unique leadership experience. Oh, that is so interesting. How did you <laughs> straddle like one leg in being a, identifying as a feminist and one leg in this entirely patriarchal structured society and and having that job of having to transmit ideas and tell people stories about what's happening from a journalist standpoint of being unbiased how did you manage that well so, so that's a good question so one is uh, you know i was i was worried that when i joined the army that i was going to get brainwashed or that i was going to lose my sense of self and definitely did not happen in fact i think when everyone's wearing a uniform you become more of yourself. Like it becomes more clear who you are. So I think I had that going for me. The second is that my, the journalist that I was with and that I served with tended to be, I think a little more liberal bunch than a lot of the rest of the military. So that was, that was interesting. And I had my own kind of cohort of people that made sense. And then um, finally, you mentioned about being an objective journalist. Yeah. The army doesn't really care about objectivity. Like that's not part of, you know, we're, it's not, I mean, that's, it's nothing against them. Like my job was not to be an independent investigative journalist. My job was to write articles for military newspapers. And that's what we did. Like, we're not there to investigate or dig up stuff. You know, we're there to write about, we're there to write for the company basically. Yeah. So yeah. it was really interesting because I was a rabble rouser a bit in high school and still a rabble rouser and, um, you know, doesn't go over quite so well in the military. Uh, but I found a way to move through it. And I think part of what I loved was learning to navigate challenging systems, which served me well in graduate school, in academia, <laughs> in the rest of the world, uh, where a lot of the, the rest of the world systems are even less kind of structured and predictable than the military. Yeah. So it, it was, it was good training. That's so, also what people say whenever there's like a really crappy experience and it's cold and rainy <laughs> and you haven't had dinner yet and you're on guard duty for six hours. Some, some smarty pants is going to say good training. <laughs> <laughs> I overcame a great obstacle in that yes. one. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about obstacles and stuff, what do, bringing your military experience and your psychology experience, what do you tell yourself when you're going through big problems and big challenges, either in your personal life or in your business life, what do you, what, what goes through your head? What do you tell yourself and how do you move forward through the obstacles? Great question. The first thing I say is what do I want? Mm -hmm. So getting really clear on what I want and making sure it's what I want, not what is expected of me or what my parents think I should do or anything else. It's what I want. What do I want? Then once I'm clear on that, my self-talk turns to I could do this. So it's really a matter of either I know how to do it, in which case it's just doing it. Or if I don't know how to do it, somebody knows how to do it. If it's ever been done before anywhere, somebody knows how to do it. So how do I find the right people? And I often start by just kind of putting some feelers out there. Like when I want to do something saying, I'm thinking of, I'll just say to somebody, Hey, I'm thinking of starting an Institute online training. Do you know anybody who does that? And people are like, what? Oh, well, yeah, I know this person. You want to talk to that? Sure. So that like we end up meeting people, but me putting it out there, then I have somebody who becomes like a, a fan of like, Hey, how's that Institute going? Did you end up talking to that person? And great. That ends up going. And then they'll mention like, well, I've always wanted to such and such, you know, anybody who does that? Yeah, actually I do. Or I don't, but I'll keep my ears out for you. And then it comes back around. I think when we, you know, if we, talk to each other in the ways of, well, I've always wanted to go to Paris and now it's never going to happen because there's a pandemic or 
yeah, I wanted to go to college once or I wanted to whatever once, you know, okay, great. Then you all sink each other down. But I think when you talk about, I've always wanted to do this, how can I do it? How can I take one step toward it? There's so much cool stuff that happens when you do that. It's almost like putting it out into the universe and being willing to take the steps, yeah. not just saying, I want to go to Paris, but who do I know that's been to Paris? Let me talk with them. Let me look up what a flight costs. Let me figure out what to do. All these different steps, you get it moving and you get other people with you and everybody cheers everybody along. How exciting. I love that. Okay. Talking <laughs> about taking steps. I know yeah. you are an avid adventurist as am yeah. I, and I know that I have totally done something that's on your adventure bucket list. Uh, uh, so, so I, I have been hiking in New Zealand and I <gasps> went from the Northern end of New Zealand, all the way down to the Southern end of New Zealand on my own two feet. And it right was the on. most incredible experience. You see it, this geography just change every single step you take. You're going from different climate zones, even in parts of the trail, you end up walking through dairy farms and you're like hanging out with these cows and hopping over streams and stuff. And it's, Amazing. it was an adventure that I literally broke my feet. They, I didn't break the bones, but I tore all the ligaments and stuff because I overhiked. It was just so exciting for me to be able to do that. And those are the experiences that have shaped who I am and really helped me find my inner strength. What kind of adventures have you gone on that have helped you find that inner strength in yourself? <sighs> had a lot of fun adventures. So let's <laughs> see. I went to... India, I was uh, finishing up my postdoc and I had bought a house that had been foreclosed upon with like the first time I was making more than minimum wage in like five years, 10 years. So I bought a house, had a mortgage and I was finishing my postdoc and I didn't have a job lined up. And I just said like, screw it. I'm going to India for a month. So I went with this group and, oh, I got way out of my comfort zone, which is what I wanted, but I got really far into my discomfort zone mm. and kind of being around a lot of poverty, seeing a lot of disparity, seeing a lot of health disparities, of course, I'm in health, a lot of, you know, there's, there's no time for mental health because the groups we were with were having such major physical health and like physical safety issues that taught me a lot. Like I'm not. Uh, at least at the time, I mean, I was, that was quite some time ago, 20 years ago, but it made me see what kind of a traveler I am when things are, are tough. And I was, I was okay, but I didn't like how cranky I got when I was physically uncomfortable. So I started working on that around how do I get better at that? And how do I get less cranky? Cause there's no reason to go traveling and then just be cranky. Like that's no fun. Yeah. So uh, there was that one that I learned a lot from. I also, I had a, a, breakup, <laughs> which is always a great impetus for travel. And I planned, I looked in uh, Europe, like what's the cheapest flight to Europe? And I got a flight to Zurich, probably a cheap flight because it is so friggin' expensive in Zurich. But I flew in, rented a car, drove down through the Alps to Milan. Oh, I stayed in Lake Como for a couple of days and then Milan and then down across the Italian Riviera. Um, Marseille, which I loved, Provence, all the way down to Barcelona, and then back up through the French Alps. And that was the sense of no matter what happens, I could do this. Like life is beautiful. This is amazing. And a lot of people I talked to are like, why? You mean you did that by yourself and weren't you bored? Or that's a lot of driving. That's like too much driving for a, for a week of a trip of that length. And I was like, what's it to you? What I do? <laughs> like I had fun. And I would listen to the same song over and over again. I'd stop every 10 minutes to go pee. Like, I don't care. Like I had fun. And it was, it was just such an amazing kind of confidence booster around, you know, I was going to go there, but I decided I want to go here. I want to check this thing out. And that was in the days before GPS. So I had like this humongous map unfolded on the steering wheel. And uh, that was, that was exciting. Oh, I love my traveling experiences of having those old maps and yes. putting them up to a dartboard and just waking up in the morning and going, okay, where are we going? Let's just figure yeah. out where the dart takes us. And yeah. oh, it's that freedom. And especially as women, because so many yes. times we're told, don't go out at night, 
don't travel alone. Definitely don't like go camping when you're sleeping, stay in like a five star place with extra security and call into your friends every day to make sure that you're okay. And it takes, it gives us like, like we're wrapped in chains almost. And instead of giving us that freedom to see the world and go, I have superpowers to, to see these communities and to help people in different places and to help myself by learning from the people around me and the experiences around me. And it's, yeah. 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 So what would you, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Uh, I was just going to say, tell, telling us, I mean, obviously we need to, everyone needs to be safe and, you know, Mm. safeguard their valuables and not go running around naked and stuff in strange places unless that's what you want to do. But I think telling women they need to stay in and not camp and do these different things that tries to make us responsible for other people's behavior. And I'm not okay with that. And if I get mugged, it is not because of what I was wearing or because I dared to leave the house at a certain time or anything else. It's because the mugger was mugging me like that. It's their behavior. And to me, what you're talking about is just even more of that patriarchal BS culture around how like women are responsible for protecting themselves because Mm -hmm. men can't control themselves. Mm -hmm. Screw that. And again, you want to stay safe when you're in different cultures and when there are different rules. And I definitely behave differently when I'm, when I don't know all the rules and when I don't know the language or so on, but it doesn't mean I lock myself up and refuse to leave the, leave the hotel or space or anything like that. Yeah, I went on this amazing adventure through South America and we created this bond of these five women who were traveling. Originally, we had gone down all by ourselves, but together we were like the power rangers and we were just so we had each other's backs and we're going out at night into places that we wouldn't have gone if we went by ourselves. But it's because we found safety in ourselves together as a community. And and I think community is so important, not just for our own safety, but if we want to thrive, like psychologically speaking, if we look at like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we actually can't progress to changing the world if we still feel unsafe, if we feel like we don't belong in a community. So what have you found about community and, and having those connections with other people? Yeah, let's see. So I moved a lot as a kid and I've continued to move as an adult. The longest I've stayed in any house anywhere is five years. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I keep moving. I actually wrote a book on leaving because I leave, you know, I've left places, I've left people, I've left jobs, I've left different things, um, which I still think that's a really important topic, but learning how to leave is important. It's also kind of, especially during the pandemic, I've been learning how to come back So I lived in Portland for nine years, and then I moved to the East Coast for a while, New York and DC, and then back to New York. So I moved back to New York, and then I moved back to Portland, and I'm kind of between New York and Portland with people that I've known, I knew 20 years ago, and then I moved away about 12 years ago, and now I'm back. And I think part of what I missed growing up moving all the time was that sense of community. So it's been really exciting to me to build that wherever I go. And thankfully, because of technology, we don't have to just write paper letters anymore, but because of, you know, WhatsApp and everything else, we can stay in touch. And whenever I travel more times than not, I know somebody there so I can, we can catch up and have lunch or have coffee or something. And and that that's amazing. And it's creating a community that's not limited by geography. And even though I say, I miss that growing up, I think part of what I learned that's also so important that, I, that I, I wouldn't trade is being able to go into a place and figure it out, whether it's an organization as a new employee or whether it's going into a community and figuring out kind of what's the pace of things, how do people get around, get around, how do people get along, how do I meet people, how do I do this? And that's part of what I love about traveling is like when the wheels of the airplane hit the ground, And I grab my stuff and I walk out of the plane and nobody speaks English and it's a different currency. I love it. Like, it's awesome. (laughs) I just, maybe that's part of like repeating my childhood, but it brings me so much joy and so much confidence to know, like, wherever I land, I'm going to, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. It may not be pretty. I may not be thrilled with everything that happens, but not only am I going to be okay, but I know how to meet people and talk to people Mm -hmm. and figure stuff out. And like, I want a Power Ranger gang of women to go through South America with. That is awesome. (laughs) (laughs) So 
when it comes to meeting other people, you have this awesome superpower of not only meeting people and not only creating incredible conversations with people, but you make projects with people. You do stuff. You you actually change the world with the help of other people. So tell us about those kinds of collaborative projects that you work on. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting because I think that's a strength that I have to be able to bring people to, together and get things done. But for many years, people, some people viewed it as a weakness. I don't know why, but uh, it didn't go over quite as well in some other environments I was in. But in any case, um, I'm the, uh, you know, when someone says like, I'll use that example again. I've always wanted to go to Paris. I'm like, really? Why? What's going on? What do you want to do? Let's get going. And I'm like, let's let's look up flights. I think it's super cheap. You could go or like, I know this great hotel. You can do that. And then the people are like, whoa, whoa, like, hold on. And I'm like, no, you said you wanted to go. And they're like, well, I have to think about it. Like, that's kind of that's not how I operate. Even had a friend who was from uh, Midwest and mentioned like, hey, here's this job in Oregon. I was thinking maybe moving to Oregon. I was like, oh, my God, that's great. You could totally pack up the car. You could sell the house. You could do this. You could do that. And he was like, whoa. So for me, like, it's so, so freaking exciting when someone says, oh, you write about millennials. You know what? You should write a book about this. And I say, great. Want to do it? And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, seriously. You want to do it? Well, I've never written a book before. That's okay. I had never written a book before I wrote a book. Like, it's okay. <laughs> you could do this. And I just, I love doing that and finding ways where I can work with people on I provide my expertise, they provide their expertise. I do a lot of the project management and keep us going and cheerleading and like, we got this. And it's so, it's so fun, not only to produce something, but to see their excitement and their pride in like, oh, we actually did this. And I'm like, yeah, see, that's the thing. When you say what you wanna do and then you do it, it gets done. Like, <laughs> and somehow I, I I know other people have different experiences with that, or, you know, maybe people say things that they don't really want. I, again, I don't understand that, but that's what I do. You have to. And I love it. Because if you have those crazy dreams and you actually want to accomplish something, yeah, you have to, you have to do something about it. Do it. Right. And a lot of people, they come up with those ideas. They, they have that passion. They have that flame inside them, but they honestly need that person like you to fan those flames and actually help them take that next step. And a lot of people will find that block and they'll just say, oh, no, too scary. That's too far out of coming back to what we talked about before with comfort zones. That's too far out of my comfort zone. That's stepping yeah. over my learning edge and into my panic zone. I'm just going right. to revert back to my comfy space here where I don't actually right. change. I don't actually push myself. And the amazing thing about the books that you write is not only do you allow that process and that evolution to happen with your co-writers, but you're also helping your readers. So you write books for an entire generation. Tell yeah. me about your series. <laughs> yes. So the Millennials Guide series uh, started with, well, I wanted to write Millennials Guide to Management and Leadership. That's the book I wanted to write because I see, I saw this was five or six years ago. I saw millennials are coming up in the workforce. They keep getting dogged by older people saying, you don't know this stuff that nobody ever told you. And I thought, well, let's tell them what people never told them. So they'll know it. Like there's no reason to pick on them about it. There's, that doesn't make any sense. So I was meeting with this group of young women who let me in their group, even though I was 15 years older than them. And whenever they'd bring up, they were very kind. I adore them they would bring up work stuff and we talk about it. And I kept focusing on management and leadership. And finally, one of them got exasperated and said, you know, I don't want to be a manager or a leader. I just want to figure out how to get my colleague to stop taking credit for my work. Or I just want to figure out how I can get some mentoring since my boss refuses to mentor me or whatever. Right. So, aha. Uh -huh. So I started with millennials guide to work and then moved on to millennials guide to management and leadership, my personal favorite. And then people started Taught, we started, I, I would mention this and people, you know what you should do, write a book on such and such. Okay, let's do it. So I wrote with a colleague of mine who's a sixth generation carpenter, a millennial's guide to construction trades. And oh my God, I learned so much. I had no idea what a boiler maker was. Like now I know all this stuff. It's very cool. And I'm working now with someone on millennial's guide to careers in law enforcement. 
with a woman psychologist who's a person of color. She's amazing. She really wants to bring social justice back into law enforcement. So very excited about that. Uh, and then started working on just more, like they keep coming, which is wonderful. So we did a Millennials and Gen Z Guide to Voting last fall. So that was a good one. Very excited about that. Um, and then it got banned by Amazon, by Facebook, because they said it was too political to suggest <laughs> that people vote. So I had okay. to work around that. It took a little while. Um, and then we just finished Millennials Guide to Relationships, which I love and just as a note on that, my colleague that I wrote that with is absolutely amazing. She's just absolutely fantastic. And she said, you know, I got most of this, but could you, you know, can you write some of the chapters stuff? I don't, you know, I think you would do better at. I said, sure, send me whatever you don't want to write. So she sent me all the chapters on breakups and sex. And I was like, what do you think of me? Come on. <laughs> but then I got to write a chapter on like, intimacy during a pandemic, which I honestly never thought I would write. So yippee for that. Interesting. Yeah. And yeah. your expertise <laughs> on leaving would come in handy with breakups. Absolutely. I, I know breakups. She's like, ah, I've been married 20 years. I don't know breaking up, but uh, that's okay. I do. I do. I definitely do. So uh, coming up next is Millennials Guide to Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And we have a workbook for that one, which I'm so excited about. Uh, Millennials Guide to Advanced Workplace Politics with this fabulous organizational psychologist that I absolutely adore. Super smart. That's going to be fun. Uh, Millennials Guide to K through 12 Education. Um, yeah. Millennials Guide to Money. I'm working on a Millennials Guide to Real Estate. Like, you got an idea? Call me, Jennifer at leadwithwisdom.com. Like, just email me. Let's talk. And I, I walk people through all the steps. We work on it together. We put it together. And you know, got a whole wall full of books here and even more. And this is, this is the empire I want to build. And I'm so excited about it. I'm also working with a fabulous young woman who's, I think, 21. She's just finishing college and she is doing a generation, generation Z guide to work. And her ideas are fabulous. Oh my God, it's going to be so fun. So it's just, it's great. I'm I so love excited. it. I love it because millennials get the short end of the stick and we always, we, we get, we get the least amount of job opportunities. We have an economy that's crap and just keeps getting worse. Yeah. We have housing markets that are out of control. Like I live in Toronto where the average yeah. house price is like a million dollars. Yeah. So yeah, we get, yeah. and then we get made fun of because we live with our parents for longer. And then we don't right. have opportunities to move up in the workplace because either the boomers are staying on forever or our companies are now um, going down to part-time work and we don't have that same job security. We've had the short end of the stick, but honestly, as I think we talked about on your show, yeah. millennials have this incredible skill set. We have yes. been raised with technology in a way that, okay, Gen Z's grown up with an iPhone in their hand, but we've grown up with one leg in the world pre-internet and one leg in the world of the internet. And we can see the possibilities of what is amazing. Yeah. And now with yeah. the pandemic happening, I've seen millennials thriving as solution oriented yeah. people in the workplace yeah. right now the millennials are the ones, the boomer managers are turning to their millennials saying, how do we fix this? How do we go on the internet? How do we communicate with our community yeah. when we can't be physically in the same spaces as it is before? How do we radically change business? And the millennials are yeah. sitting there going, you're asking for my input? Yeah. <laughs> I know how to do that. And the Gen Xers, my generation is just like sitting over on the side, minding their own business. <laughs> not doing anything. <laughs> but yeah, just millennials. Found in the retirements. Yeah. <laughs> I am totally with you on uh, millennials have so much good stuff, which is why it just kills me that some, some older generations, including my generation, Generation X and baby boomers are are just dumping on them. It's just not right. You are an amazing, resilient, creative, innovative, enthusiastic, passionate generation. And I am so excited about what will, what will come next, especially since like, we don't have a choice. You would think even just self-preservation would lead people to not bag on millennials who are going to be the people taking care of them and making the rules really shortly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but Hey, whatever. It's all good. And uh, everything I could do to support millennials and then Gen Z, 
Gen Z coming after, I'm happy to do that. The Most of the books are subtitled what no one ever told you about such and such. So really trying to provide that sense. And all of the books go through a cadre of brilliant, I think, millennials who are reviewers for the books and they do not shy away from giving feedback and saying, nope, you can't, no, this does not work or you need to add this or you have to talk about that. Make sure you include this. They are amazing. So I, I that's like millennial stamp of approval <laughs> to get these out there. Um, yeah. And if you're interested, again, let me know, Jennifer at leadwithwisdom.com. Oh, I love it. So not only are you creating community with your co-authors, you're creating community with your readers, but you're also like, you're literally inspiring a generation to pick their shit up and to lead the world and lead with wisdom. Like that's the idea. Empowerment. The whole thing is about empowerment. I don't care what relationship decisions you make. I don't care if you want to be a manager, a leader, or if you don't, but if you do, I'm happy to help. And I want to empower you to make whatever choices you want to make, not based on what someone else tells you you should do, but how to do that. It's the same thing I'm doing with, I just launched an institute, Wisdom Institute for Empowerment. I I didn't use my name for like years and years. And now I'm like, screw it. I got a good name. I'm going to use it. So Wisdom Institute for Empowerment, it's for people who are early and mid-career, healthcare, academic, nonprofit, kind of working in any of those areas. And it's designed to help them be the leaders they want to be. And it's a a year-long program. You could take as little or as much as you want. And it's more than 100 uh, topics, 100 topics that there's video, there's worksheets, there's uh, weekly networking meetings. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. And again, it's all about empowering people to bring their gifts to the world in whatever way they want to. Oh, I love it. I love it. And to be an amazing leader, you don't have to be the loudest person. You don't need to be the person at the front of the the line all the time. Right. And when I teach about leadership, I love to use the example of a wolf pack, where if you look at a, a pack of wolves, a multi-generational pack of wolves, the leaders in the front are actually the oldest, most fragile and slowest members of the community. They're the ones who are going to set the pace for everyone else. And the strongest of the leaders are those who are in the back. They're the ones making sure your whole team is moving on. Everyone stays together and you leave no one behind. Leadership isn't about being the loudest or the flashiest or the most in your face. It's about being consistent. It's about loving your people and serving your community and really being focused on those missions. If we come all the way back to the beginning of our chat today, when you talked about setting goals being the first thing, asking yourself, what do I actually want to accomplish? If you keep that in your head, my friends, that is how you're going to proceed forward, no matter how big your community is. If it's just you at first and you're that lone wolf trudging your way through the forest, or if you have this thriving, huge community of people around the world, my friends lead with wisdom. (laughs) (laughs) You totally got this. I love it. I love it. And also just to clarify, in case there's any question, you don't need to be a dude. You don't need to be white. You don't need to be wealthy. You don't have to have a degree. You can make leadership. You can become a leader anywhere, anytime about anything. Find something you're passionate about. Start persuading other people to care about it and start doing stuff. That makes you a leader. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so how can people get into your world? How can they hear your podcast? How can they read your books? Tell us everything. Sure, sure, sure. sure. So leadwithwisdom.com is my website. And there's information there about the books, about the Institute and about my podcast. The podcast is called Millennial Wisdom. And I interview millennials about like you, about all the amazing things that you're doing. And I have yet to find a millennial that doesn't have at least one, usually more side hustles. So totally blowing the stereotype of millennials as lazy out of the water every time. (laughs) So Millennial Wisdom is the podcast, Lead with Wisdom is the website. And then I have the Millennials Guides are available on Amazon and and everywhere. And then uh, the Wisdom Institute, you can get the information on the website. It's just getting started. And I am so thrilled about this. It's like, it's me talking to people. Like everyone is a sermon of like, you can do this, whatever the topic is you know, here's how you can be, you can assert your authority. You can be a boss at work. Here's how you can do this. Here's how you can do that. And I'm so excited about it. Yes. And you can be a boss without trampling on others. It's this wild idea. Yeah, I know. 
Who would have thunk? It's the world is changing and I am so amazed and excited and honored to be a part, to play my small part in kind of helping things move forward. And someone asked me like, what's your big goal here? Well, my big goal is to help empower millennials to do whatever they want to do. I want to make millennial a good thing. Mm -hmm. People are like, whoa, you know how to pick big issues. (laughs) Yes, I do. But I want it to be a good thing. I want people to be proud to have come through 9-11 and pandemic and recession and all this craziness and to have come of age at the millennium. Like that's so exciting. That's so exciting. So really want to help people feel pride in who they are. That's amazing. And pride in what you can do and the ways you can make the world a better place. Yeah. And even when the world feels like all the weight is on your shoulders and you feel small and insignificant, you can still make huge change. Like I, Absolutely. I'm obsessed with tattoos. I, I have quite a few <laughs> and uh, down one of my legs, I have a series of chess pieces uh, cascading down my leg Ooh. and each of the chess pieces was picked for a different reason, but I have a pawn and the pawn represents the fact that even if you feel insignificant, even if you feel like the lowest of the pieces, the least amount of value you bring to the world, when those moments happen, remember that a well-placed pawn can still win a game of chess. It doesn't Absolutely. matter what your strength is uh, compared to that, what you are coming up against. If you're trying to change a system and you think that it's built and it's oppressing people and it's built wrong and it's not working anymore, remember it was another person who put that system together. So it can be another person who can drastically change that. And it right just, all it takes is knowledge. It takes accountability and it takes that will and the perseverance to actually make those changes. And your books are the SOPs. They are the guides. They are the field guides to getting this shit done, my friends. If you're working in big business, if you're working in small business, if you're working for yourself in the construction trades or law enforcement or whatever, if you see a better world out there and you just need the few little tips, the tricks, the knowledge to get it done, We got the books for (laughs) you. Crazy. Like the tools are out there for you guys to dismantle these houses and rebuild them to great palaces that help everyone do better. And I'm, I'm so excited that I'm part of your community. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Me too. Me too. This is great. We're going to do, we're going to continue to do great things together. Absolutely. Any last words for our audience before we sign off today? I just want to share that whatever it is you're struggling with, whoever is listening, whatever you're struggling with, you're not alone and you can get through this. There are people out there who want to help you find them. Write me. I'm happy to talk with you, but absolutely you can do this and you're here for a reason. So figure it out and go make good in the world. Oh, I love it. I just got goosebumps. Oh, Dr. (laughs) Jennifer Wisdom. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute blast. My pleasure. This was wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. And for those of you listening at home, make sure you go hang out with Dr. Jennifer Wisdom. Check out her podcast. Go through every single episode until you find my episode (laughs) and then watch all the rest of them as well because they're amazing, amazing people she brings on, amazing information out there. And it's it's a community you want to be part of. If you actually want to change the world for the better, my friends, this is the jet fuel you need in your movement. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. I'm Coach Molly from visibilityhacking.com. I will see you in our next episode. And until then, go change the world, be excellent to each other, and remember that I love you.